Okay, so our class today is idealistic or realistic, right? We all have those ideals that we want to be, that we want to do, that we want to accomplish. And uh, then we have to be realistic. And what we're going to try to touch on today, how can we obviously be realistic? Because idealistic is easy to say, I will, I will, I want and this, and then we don't want to fall down. So today's a special day. We'll start with that. And again, Hello to everyone who joins. Today is Rosh Chodesh. We have two days of Rosh Chodesh. This month we have today, Thursday, is the, the 30th day of Sivan from the last month. And tomorrow is Aleph Tammuz, the first day of Tammuz. As we know that in the Hebrew calendar, we have some, day, some months are 29 days and some are 30. So when it's 30, then we have two days of Rosh Chodesh, the 30th of the old month and the first of the new month. Or... When we have 29 days, then we just have one day of Rosh Chodesh and Tammuz. We have the two. Uh, we're not going to speak long about it, but we do know that Rosh Chodesh is a very special day for us women. As we know, when the Jewish people were in the desert, and unfortunately, they made a very, very big mistake. They counted one day less when Moshe was at Mount Sinai, it was basically in heaven for 40 days and 40 nights. They counted wrong. And on the 39th day, they thought it was the 40th. So they said, oh, what happened? Now Moshe died, who's going to be our God? And they decided to go collect right um, gold and jewelry from everyone. And when they came to the women, usually women wear more jewelry than men. The women did not participate in the fundraising, if I may, of fundraising to, to build an idol. They said, no, we are not going to give our jewelry to build an idol. They gave a lot of their jewelry and gold and silver when we read later in the Torah, when we had to build the Mishkan, the tabernacle. The women brought a lot. The women did a lot. It just shows that women are very charitable, not less than men, and they wanted to give. But here they didn't want to give, not because they were stingy, because they did not want to give to an idol. And the Rebbe explains it's a hard thing to understand, to, to believe, to understand. Hello, Mrs. Wedra, how are you? So good to see you. We missed you for a few weeks. Hello, hello. The reason that the women had that, even though they were enslaved for so many years, they had all that trauma for the children being taken away and all the things that the women and the men suffered while in Egypt, for some reason, the women were very connected and they had very strong emuna, very strong faith. And they said, there is no way that Moshe Rabbeinu died. Moshe Rabbeinu is going to come back. Let's wait. We are not going to participate in the fundraising to build an idol. We are not going to be an idol. And they did not give anything. And then, as we know, in the end, unfortunately, the golden calf and the whole thing. And then Moshe Rabbeinu did come back with the tablets. But because of that, it says in many um, this is in the Torah, in the oral Torah that explained it later, that Rosh Chodesh is a very special day for women. We don't sew, we don't do um, laundry. It's a special day to celebrate in many ways. I mean, it's, it's special for men as well. We have special prayers and so on. But it's always considered a women's holiday. And that's why in many places we have a thing that would be called Rosh Chodesh groups or Rosh Chodesh society. Women get together once a month. Baruch Hashem, we are very special. We get together once a week. So just to know that we have a lot of power today and tomorrow to ask Hashem to do more, to build on our faith that we have, to awaken our faith. We can have something good in us, but it can be dormant, right? Something bad can be dormant. And something good can be dormant too, <clears throat> but we want to awaken the good that we have and use it wisely. The other thing that we wanted to speak today that we said that the least realistic is, uh, I'm sure many of us know that Motei Shabbat, Saturday night and Sunday <clears throat> is the third of Tammuz. The third of Tammuz is a very special day we can look at it as a sad day, but we have to look at it as a happy day because God willing, Moshiach will come. That's the day that 27 years ago, hello, hello, everyone who's joining us. 27, hello, Senel. Years ago, the Rebbe uh, went, as we have it in our calendar, to, the, to a mission, ascended to the mission to bring Moshiach. As we know, also grows the third of Tammuz, 
many, many years ago, thousands of years ago, Joshua, Yoshua, that was conquering the land, he had a battle. I'll just say it quickly. Uh, for those of us not familiar, he had a battle in Giv'on, in a place in Israel, and he was trying to win the war from the enemies and take it for the Jewish people. And he needed sunlight a little bit longer in order to win the war. So I'm just gonna see if somebody, okay. And what did Moshe do? What did Yoshua do? He said, Shemesh Begivon Dom. He said to Hashem, he prayed and he said, son, stop where you are. Don't continue. And the moon as well. Basically, the, the galaxies, the, 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 the big illuminators, the sun and the moon stopped. The world did not continue turning. And um, the daylight continued longer in that place in Israel. And I remember reading scientific evidence to that as well. Later on, they were able to find that that thing had happened. I think it was about three hours. And the way we look at it, that, that Yoshua stopped the sun from setting. So although the third of Thomas seems like it was a sad day, but Hashem is not going to sun, uh, Hashem stopped the sun from setting and, and Mashiach will come. And we know also that on the third of Tammuz, some years before 1994, in 19, I think it was in 1927, the previous Rebbe was told that he's going to be released, that they are not going to, God forbid, take his life. And that was the beginning of the redemption. He was still ex he was still exiled, but and he, he was still in exile in, in jail. But on the third of Thomas, they told him, "You're gonna, we're not gonna, God forbid, take away your life." And then on the twelfth of Thomas, nine days later, they let him go free. So the third of Thomas was the beginning of the redemption. I know that sometimes it might be difficult for us to see how the third of Tammuz 27 years ago was the beginning of redemption, but we do have to see because we're doing more mitzvot and more mitzvot and Hashem will bring us Mashiach. So I wanted to today to concentrate on something new that we never discussed before about the life of the Rebbe. There is so much what to discuss, so much what to learn. And I know so many of us heard and learned a lot about the Rebbe, what he taught us, what we can learn from him. I remember last year I shared many, some, maybe some of you remember, uh, I sent it by, um, probably by WhatsApp and by email, a picture of myself getting a dollar from the Rebbe with my little Yossi, which is turning actually in 15 days, his birthday is the 15th of Tammuz. He's turning 33, I guess he was born in 1988, right? So it's 33. Kinahora. Well, Khan is turning 34 and we're 35 years married. So I guess he's 33. I'm trying to remember one after another, right? Hal, it's a good way to remember, right? The, the, the birthday of the kids. Baruch Hashem, thank God. So I know I shared that picture and I shared, you know, my encounter, some of my encounters with the Rebbe and so on and so forth. But today we'll dwell on something else, something different, how the Rebbe cared and what the Rebbe taught us. A story, um, um, a story is told by one of the people that went by, I mean, millions, thousands, thousands went by the Rebbe. I don't know what numbers we have. But one time a lady went by the Rebbe and the Rebbe told her that I didn't see you in a long time. You weren't here. And the Rebbe, then the Rebbe continued saying that precious things, precious stuff, you don't see very often. You know, like if you have a jewelry or something like certain things you keep, special dishes, special things you take out of special moments, something special. How nice is it to say that to that person? The Rebbe wanted to make that person, that lady feel good, that she's special. And the Rebbe noticed that she wasn't there for a while. She asked the Rebbe for the blessing he gave her and the Rebbe would say, said something like that it's so special. There was once also, I heard that the Rebbe said to a convert that converted 100% Ka'alacha from Jew, from Yid, the Rebbe told him, I think it was a, a man, the Rebbe told him, you know that Hashem loves you more than me. Because the Torah speaks a lot about the you should love the convert because a convert might feel sometimes inferior 
I don't have a family, I don't have cousins, I don't have people in the Jewish community that I'm relatives with, people might look down at me and so on and so forth. And the Torah speaks a lot, you should love the convert, you should love the convert. So the Rebbe is telling him, you know, the Torah speaks so much about loving the convert, so God loves you more than me. Just the Rebbe always wanted to make everyone feel good, but not just feel good, he meant it. And the Rebbe would give us power. And one of the gifts, the Rebbe, as we said before, gave us many gifts. One of the gifts that the Rebbe bestowed upon us, that the Rebbe taught us, were the 12 psukim, the 12 passages. And this is something special, perhaps some of you heard, and uh, maybe some of you saw those videos of the Rebbe when the Rebbe made rallies with the children. A rally means a gathering. The Rebbe would gather children. The adults usually would move to the side and the shul downstairs in 770 was full of children. There would be women there that were the teachers or the counselors. I was there many times as well as a counselor of the group. Uh, there would be men, young men or older men that were teachers, but otherwise the whole place was full of children can or the Rebbe would speak to them. And those 12 passages that the Rebbe had taught us to say, I'm soon gonna say how it came about, the Rebbe would spend so much time. And unlike Baomer, you would see it, the Rebbe would stand and listen. And they would pick, usually from the community, they would pick children, one or two kids to say each phrase, each pasuk of the Torah. There were 12, each pasuk. And, and they would say it and everyone will repeat. So one of the Sukim, let's say, not let's say, is Shema Israel. So they will say Shema and everybody will say Shema Israel, Israel. It would take a long time. And you would see how the Rebbe would stand and listen. The Rebbe was so busy. The Rebbe had so much on his shoulders, so many letters to answer, so much to learn, so much to care about. And he would stand and he would smile. He would look at the kids. He would clap his hands when they would finish. And you were able to see on the Rebbe's lips that the Rebbe would say the psukim as well. The Rebbe would say it also. It's very, very special. And I remember thinking many times, like, it's something for children. The Rebbe said for children to say. No, it's not. The Rebbe encouraged that children should memorize, learn it by heart. And the Rebbe started it in 1976. I remember I was a child in Israel. And um, the Rebbe called that year the year of education, Shnat Hachinuch, the year of education. And the Rebbe spoke, the Rebbe gave six phrases to learn. And it's not phrases, not psukim verses that he made up. It's psukim from the Torah, from the Chumash, from the Tanya, from Kabbalah, from different places, from Gemara, different places. The Rebbe collected 12 verses. And, and in Lag Baomer, he, on that year, 1976, he finished the last six, he told us. And he said that everybody, the children especially, should learn it by heart and say it every day. And we know that um, uh, I'm sure, um, Eugenia, you remember when we had carpool together with uh, Shmuel and my kids, when they would drive to school every morning, they would say the psukim, Torah, Tziva, Shema Israel, Kol Israel, all kind of psukim. We learned it by heart and we teach it to the children since they're born, since they learn a little, we say it with them and they listen, they listen and they know it by heart. I have to share something with you. I wish I was able to, show you the video, I should really do it once. Our little um, Yosef, Levi's oldest son, he's already a big boy, he's already over three, but when he was probably a year old, they would say with him psukim, the psukim, the verses, and the way we would say it is, the Rebbe wanted the children to say it with a lot of enthusiasm, you know, we want kids to be happy and do a lot of enthusiasm, right? As some of us here have young kids like Hagit and, and Janina and you know, and, and so on, uh, and other kids, we, uh, and, and grandkids that we have. So they would say, uh, Torah, Tziva, right? They would say, Torah, they would go with the hand, you know, like Torah, Tziva, you know, they would do it in a, with a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of passion, and so on and so forth. Now, little, um, little, uh, how you call it, uh, Yosef couldn't speak then. 
still. So Levi sent us, they were still in New York. So Levi sent us a video once. It was very cute. Till he learned to speak, he would say, I would say, Torah. And yes, I would say, yay. That was the word he said. Tziva, yay. Lonu, yay. Moshe. It was so sweet because you hear Levi say in that, that little voice, yay. Yay. That's the way he would answer. Some words he knew, he would say, who? Like uh, who he was able to repeat, but otherwise he was excited. So he would say yay because the father, my son Levi, said it with a lot of excitement. So the you know the little guy felt it as well, and it was very very amazing um, what the Rebbe taught us. And I have to tell you, girls, that I I know it since I was a little kid. I was eleven or twelve at the time when I learned it, nineteen seventy six. We learned it by heart. I remember then it was to learn by heart and we used to learn it on Shabbos in Israel. I mean, you're allowed to carry, you have a lot of eating, you cannot live in every place. So we always had like Shabbos party. But the Shabbos party was actually on Shabbos itself in the afternoon, after shul, and then we had lunch and then three o'clock, four o'clock, we would go two, whatever time it was, we would get together and we would learn the verses and we would learn other signishnayot by heart, like the boys separate, the girls separate, and we would get um, uh, treats and we would get stores. It was like something, it was amazing. Like I'm thinking about it, how much richness, you know, what we had, it was just like coming from the sleeve, so easy because, you know, the older girls, the older boys just did it with the younger ones. And then when we grew up, we did it with the younger ones. You know, that's just the way it was. Everybody lived close. It wasn't hard. We didn't have to walk far and so on and so forth. And we learned, we knew it by heart. And, you know, and then Baruch Hashem, when we got married, we had children, we continued uh, doing it. Uh, Baruch Hashem. I want to share, I hope, I'll have a minute, but I just remembered some of the story and I do want to share with you the beauty and how special it is to say that the 12, the 12 verses. It's nothing to do with what we were going to learn, but just to show the power of it as well. Uh, perhaps you know, very, very sad fact in Israel. I'm sure all our Israeli girls are here and, and maybe some of you, even though you didn't live in Israel, you know, there are many Israeli girls that become friendly with Arab men. First, they think they're Jewish. A lot of them look like Jewish guys. They sometimes even put a kippah or whatever. They become friendly with the Jewish girls. And then they, they, they find the people who are vulnerable, who don't have perhaps good homes, who don't do good in school, who need that love, that, you know, fake love. It's not real love. And they talk them into going and moving with them, marrying them, and going to the Arab villages. It's really, really sad. There is so many of them. And there is a special, so many girls that go there. And then once they go there, they can't escape. And they come, and all of a sudden, all the gold and all the silver and all the stuff that they were promised that they will have is not there. They come to a house, and all of a sudden, they see that there is already three or four other women in that house. She is not the wife of that guy that told her that she'll, he, she, he'll, she'll marry him, he'll marry, he'll give her this. And she, they, they become basically like slaves. You know how women are treated there and it's terrible. And then those kids that are born, they're Jewish kids and they raise as Muslims. And it's very sad because you have so many people who throw rocks at the Jews and those, they're supposed to be, the Muslim kids, but they're not they're really Jewish because their mothers are Jewish. It's very, very sad. I want to go into it. There is a special organization in Israel that is called Yad Laachim, a hand for the brothers. And they try in amazing ways to save those women, to save those girls. And obviously they fell in a trap. They didn't realize and by the time they realized it was still, you know, they were already there. And at one time, I don't know how they communicate and so on, but it's amazing how they save them. I heard that story firsthand, actually, from uh, Rabbi Binyamis and Esther Groner's father. He was in Calgary some years ago, and he said that he heard it from the rabbi that actually was involved in rescuing the mother with, um, with her kids. So somehow, I guess that village, they knew that the people are coming in to get the kids, to get her kids. 
perhaps maybe she already escaped and now they wanted, I think she already escaped and they wanted to get the children. So they didn't want them to get the kids. The kids were taken away from the house where they lived. And now the rabbis that are coming in, the people, they, I don't know, however they were dressed, they come in, obviously in disguise and so on and so forth. They had to go to a house that had a lot, a lot of kids. There were a lot of kids. They put a lot of Arab kids there and everybody. And how will they know who the kid, how will they take them? And it was, and, and they hid them. It was a very crazy story. So they asked the mother, what can we say? What should we do? And I hope everybody's listening because your, your, hair, your, your hair standing here. What should, how should we know that those kids should come to us? We can't take all the kids from that room. We have to take two kids. I think she had a boy and a girl. How should we know? What do they know Jewish? What do they know that we can say different? The mother was very sad. She started crying. She said, you know what? I didn't teach them anything. I didn't know anything. But something I did know, when I was a little girl, in my moshav, in my little place, the Chabad people would come every week and they would gather us together and they would give us treats and they would tell us stories and they would teach us the psukim, the 12 passages. They said that the Rebbe said to learn, they would teach it to us by heart. I really have shivers. And she said, you know what? That's the only thing that I remembered. So when I had my kids, I knew they're Jewish because I'm Jewish. I suffered so much there with them, but I wanted to teach them that they were Jewish. So I would say with them the psukim every day, every day I, I said with them, I told them that's the only Jewish thing they know. So she said to them, Torah, Tziva, Lanu, Moshe, Moshe, Kilat, Yaakov, Shema, Yisrael, Hashem, Elkin, Hashem, Echad, Bechol, Dor, Vador, Chayav, Adam, all the, all the psukim, Bereshit, Bara, Elokim. So you know what they did, those people, when they heard that? They came into that place where those children were hidden on their place, because there were other kids, but those kids, they hid, and they started saying it. They started saying it out loud. They said it out loud. And all of a sudden, uh, really, the person said it himself. He said, if he wouldn't see it, he wouldn't believe it. All of a sudden, two little kids ran out and started screaming and started saying it with them, and they hugged the Jewish people that came to rescue them and Baruch Hashem were able to rescue them quickly and they took them to Israel from the from that village and reunited with the mother and, and with her family. It's an amazing story, the power of those passages. You know how it was able to save them there because the little the, that woman, unfortunately, she went so low and went whatever she did, but she remembered that as a child that she learned it. And there was very strong that every child should learn and so on. But what we're learning it here is, I, I want to speak about a few of the psukim that it's really, when you look at the 12 passages, and perhaps we'll take time today, we'll discuss just a few, we don't have a lot of time, how it's like a 12 step program that the Rebbe had bestowed upon us to learn how to live our life, how the old ideals that we have should not stay just in the idealistic world, but it should be realistic. And I would really like to share with some of the, I mean, with all of you, I guess, the 12 psukim, perhaps we should email it or send it to you, especially the ones that have young children and have young grandkids, that the children should start memorizing and saying it. What does it mean to memorize? Why do we have to memorize? Why can you just read it. It makes such a big difference, girls. When we learn something, when you memorize, it becomes part of you. So let's try to understand a little bit. The Rebbe did say to learn it, the Rebbe really spoke. He didn't say that adults should learn it. The Rebbe emphasized the children. Til bar and bas mitzvah. That's what the Rebbe spoke. Children, children, children. And usually when we say children, you think bar and bas mitzvah. But we have to see beyond that. We have to understand. Really, all of us are children. I know when I try to explain to my grandchildren that Bobby is also somebody's baby, somebody's daughter, and Baruch Hashem, my father should be well for many years. And I said, you know, the Zaidi, Zaidi is, you know, so I asked them, who is my tati, right? They say, Rabbi Matzah, right? They think my husband is. That's how kids are. Who is his mommy? 
I miss mommy, right? Little children, they always think that. But then we try to explain to them that, you know, this. And so when they get a little bit older, they understand. I said, you know, I'm also somebody's child. I am Zadie's child, you know? And so we're all somebody's children, our parents. But for sure, we are the children of Hashem. And it's interesting how Hashem always speaks to us also in the Torah. He says, Bnei Israel, the children of Israel. We are children. The Rebbe is teaching us something here that to be a child is something very special. A child is curious, wants to learn more. A child is innocent. A child is happy. A child wants to learn, wants to observe, wants to do. They're not set in their ways. They want to do more. Well, we expression, I'd like to read it. Growing is important. Growing. But being all grown up is actually not an ideal. What does it mean? Don't we want to be grown up? What we're trying to say is that to be grown up, sometimes many people when they grow up, they don't want to be children anymore. They don't want to learn anymore. A child always wants to learn. They grow, they, they explore, everything is new. I already, I'm a grown up. How many kids tell, how many people tell you, people tell me, I know, I don't have to come to the class. I know already everything. I, we become stuck in our ways. We know everything better than somebody else. And many times we become judgmental. We become, we judge people. We become cynical. We become, why? Because we are grown ups. We think we know it all. We have to become, we have to grow. We have to become adults, but we want to do it in a mature way, staying with the youth. The Rebbe was a very young at heart person. The Rebbe always was, and we have here somebody who's so much young at heart. Um, Mrs., uh, you're still here with us, right? Uh, I'm trying to see if we still have Mrs. Ledger. Yes. Um, and uh, sorry, I have to see because I have, um, no, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Um, Jennifer Brown, if you don't mind to look, I wrote you something. Thank you. Uh, and, and what's up? Okay. Yes, I saw I saw it. Yes. I got your message. Thank you. So I can go ahead? Yes, please. Okay. So many times, and the Rebbe encourages us to see the power what youth has. When the Rebbe turned 70, the people said, oh, you're going to retire now. And the Rebbe did even more. The Rebbe said, the older we get, we have to do more. The Rebbe always wanted, he believed in changing the world, in doing the world, in, in making it a good world. The Rebbe says, since he was a young child of two or three years old, he already started to fathom, to think, what will the world look like when Moshiach will come? What is the purpose of creation? The end of times, the end of times means good life. The Rebbe was always even though he went through a very hard life, we spoke about it once. I mean, some of you were here or not. But anyway, being born in 1902, having World War I, having World War II, living through the Depression, immigrating, all the things, seeing so many relatives go, so many, unfortunately. And some of us, you know, especially Mrs. Wedrow, have seen it. And many, and many of us, unfortunately, all our family who perished in the Holocaust, unfortunately. And, and so many things that Rebbe went through and being childless and so on. And Rebbe was so positive, always looked to do more and more and more. And that's why we decided this class to take, to learn something from the 12th psukim, from the 12th passages to see for us what we can learn from here to, us, to, to ourselves. I want to say something that we have something very special um, to share. We have a very special uh, dedication to the end of our class. Uh, we were hoping that somebody else will be here, but last week somebody else wasn't here. So let me say it. The aunties, the nieces, the, the whole family of Risha and Shoshana 
and Jennifer Brown is the auntie. We have a very special simcha that we're celebrating because Risha became a grandmother to uh, her Kinahora little boy. And the bris was last week. And we wanted really to do last week to say the Basel Tov. And Shoshana was on, but Risha wasn't on. So we decided to wait for this week, but now Shoshana is not here. So we still want to do it. And I'm sure you'll share with her. Maybe she'll listen to the class. So Shoshana had her first baby boy, her first baby all together, Kinahora. And they named him, as if, if I'm maybe... Risha or Jennifer want to say more is named after their father. Beautiful, beautiful name. Chaim Dov, I think, right? So maybe you'll say a few words. And it's so nice. What a nice thing. And it's so nice in this class. Thank you very much for the donation that all of them got together. They wanted to surprise. And here we have two sisters. That one is became a, a Bobby, a grandma, and one became an auntie, like a grand, a grand auntie, I guess, right? And, uh, and one became a mother. She got married about a year and a little bit, a year and a half ago, two years ago, so on. And it's really, really nice. So we always thank you again. It's always nice when we sponsor cl uh, the class, we dedicate classes. And, um, and it's so special, special when you get it for a birthday, for a birth, for, for whatever it is, you know? And if there's a your side, obviously it's very special and you did do for your mother, for your father, Risha and Jennifer. And now we're doing for the living, it's so special. So maybe one of you wants to say something for two minutes and then we'll continue the class, Risha, perhaps. And thank you, Jennifer, for the surprise. Surprise, mazel tov, <laughs> my best sister in the whole wide world. Yeah, so little, little baby boy, uh, whose name is Dove Bear, after my Risha's father's, so my father's Hebrew name was Dove in Hebrew and in Yiddish, is bear right. so but then it just made sense his english name was bernard so that b-e-r bernard i never made the connection till now so little baby boy is dove bear shoshana said she called him her little bear i thought that was adorable <laughs> anyway <laughs> so he's just a few weeks old and just so lovely we're just have met virtually because she's far away south of the border so we miss them very much. And yes, I just want to say mazel tov. That's if Rita wants to say anything, I'll let her say it for a moment. And we'll get back to you, Rachel. Yeah, I'm actually a little speechless. This is totally a surprise. And Shoshana would have been on. She doesn't like to miss a class, but she's busy getting into her nursing routines. <laughs> We and, that, yeah. and and our our little dove bear it's just a namesake for for our father who was a very very special person he um he he went through the holocaust in a different way than some because he was born in london england and when he turned 18 he immediately volunteered wow. and uh, to serve and he served in the allied forces in the British Royal Navy. And there's many, many incredible stories that I could share. Maybe there'll be an opportunity to share some, but he survived and he was able to come to Canada and meet my mother who was born here in Canada. Wow. And they built a wonderful life together and uh, raised us children. We have a brother, we have one sister who sadly passed away young and we just had a, a wonderful life that they built for us here. And he, in his own way, came out of the Holocaust by serving in the Allied forces. So it, that's a big story. <laughs> so it's not the appropriate be, time to be, share it, but maybe another class, time. You'll be able to share. Like we'll, yeah, it would be very a privilege. And I know we'll tell Shoshana, <laughs> who's busy nursing right now. And I'm just totally surprised. And just a pre I really feel encompassed by the love of everybody here. In, in Thursday night, I look forward to it. And I hope that the day will come soon when we'll all be out of the pandemic and I'll come to Calgary and we call okay. all meet in person because I feel very to close to everybody. Oh, thank you, so thank nice. you. And I give love. Amazing to all of you too. I was surprised when Jennifer told me, I said, you know, Shoshana came to the class. She never said she was like 
had a baby a few days before the after bush and never said anything. I would never know, you know, and then you said, so I kept a secret. I didn't want to say nothing last week. And then she says, oh, you know, Richard, you wrote me, you won't be there. So that's why I'm sorry. I asked Jennifer, should we say something or not? So anyway, you'll tell. I didn't want to keep the secret for so long. So we'll continue, girls. So nice everybody else will join. So to me, to, to continue a little bit more as we're speaking here about the, the, the youth, how the Rebbe was tell, telling us that we have to stay young. We have to stay young. You know, you see people are young at heart and people that always want to do because when we become old, it's not the ages, we all want to become older. We all want to become mature and learn and so on, but we cannot lose the, the qualities that children have. And that's what the Rebbe said. The Rebbe also, when the Rebbe started the whole thing with education more and more, in 1980, Tav Men, the Rebbe spoke as well. And the Rebbe said, it's interesting that when the Jewish people went out of Egypt and they were crossing the sea on Kriyat Yamsub, when they split the sea, it says, Hem Hikiruhu Tchila. They recognize Hashem first. They saw the godliness, the godliness of Hashem first. Who is they? The children. How old were those children? The, um, when we learn about when the Jewish people were in the in, in Mitzrayim and they were um, slaves, when Moshe Rabbeinu was born, right? Why was he put in the in the little basket because they wanted to kill every Jewish boy, every Jew, Jewish boy that was born in the world because they saw in, in the stars, right? Uh, that um, a baby will be born to take the Jewish people out of Egypt. So, and, and, and the Jewish women still continued having kids and it was very hard. They were working all day. We know the stories that the Medrash is telling us how those children grew up amazingly. Angels would come to feed them. The parents weren't home. It was, they were very special children. But those children grew up with a lot of faith, with a lot of whatever the parents were able to teach them. They taught them, and they were very special children. But those children, when they went out of Egypt, Moshe Rabbeinu, it says that when he went out of Egypt, he was saved as a baby, right? But he was 80 years old. So... When we learned that it explains a lot of those children were not young kids. They were older. They were older, they were older men and women. And the Torah is telling us they were children because they learned so much, so strong, so saturated with the emuna, with the faith, with real Yiddishkeit, real stuff that it stayed with them so strong even when they when they were older. They wanted to be as children, as we said, the beautiful thing that kids have always to learn, to do, to get, to ask, not just, okay, I know I'm stuck up. I know better than you, you know this. Kids always usually get more directions than we like to get. Who are you to tell me? Well, I'm not a child. Don't tell me what to do. But the only way we learn is when we ask, when, when we want to learn, and so on and so forth. And that was something very, very special, the optimism that they had. and. They wanted to go out of Egypt. They wanted to do things. And obviously there were kids there as well, but not all of the kids were kids' kids. You know, they were older. There's an interesting story that I wanted to share with you um, that a child was, um, a child went to school. The mother was very overprotected over the child. And uh, usually the child would walk home from school but there was thunder and lightning and raining and this. So she said, you know what? I'm, it, it's so close. I'm going to drive quickly and bring my child. She was overprotected. The kids, the child will get scared. So she drove quickly to the school. She comes to the school and uh, she goes, the, the principal says, the child already left. She goes, what? He's walking my poor little kid. She, my poor little boy. So she's driving on the path that she hopes the child walks. And as she's driving, she sees him walking. And all of a sudden, there's a strong lightning, a lot of light. And she thinks, oh, the child will be probably so scared. And the kid picks up, the little boy picks up his face and he smiles to the light. And then she picks up and she says, come get to the car, they come home. And the child tells her, and so she asks him, my little uh, 
let's say Moishala. Why should we say Johnny? Let's say a Jewish name, my little Moishala. Why were you smiling? He says, you know, Ma, from time to time, God is looking down at me, he's taking a picture. It's not very often. So when I was walking, God took a picture. It was lightning, the flash. So I picked up my face and I smiled so he can see my, so he can take a picture with a smiley face. It's such a wonderful story. It sounds cute, but so many times we go through things in life and we look at it's thunder, lightning, it's bad, it's this, it's that. Let's look at it. If we can look at it as children and we can look at it with a nice eye. Yeah, it's something difficult. You have to go through it. You can get wet. You can get hurt sometime a little bit. But if you look at it, God is, is really giving you another opportunity. Sometimes we're going through little challenges, but let's look at it as an opportunity for something higher, for something greater. When we don't look at it with eyes, with the heart of a child, to be younger heart, we get scared. We think, you know, because we have anxiety, what will be here, what will be there, and what will happen? Children, why children don't get scared? Because they don't know as much. They didn't live that long. Yet, God willing, it should live very, very long. So they don't know if, if you're going to do this and this, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. We know we've seen too much. So we are worried too much. But really, we have to have the emunah of a child that everything is going to be okay. When you hold the child in your hands, they feel so safe, so secure. You might be worried because you know you're going to do something now that might be dangerous or you're going through or you don't know uh, if you're going to make this or what's going to happen tomorrow or whatever. You might be going through a difficult time, but the child doesn't know. And as long as you hold the child and you cuddle him or her, they feel safe. That's how we have to work on ourselves to feel safe in the hands of Hashem, because we are children in the hands of Hashem. We have to be able to open up our eyes and see it. And it's very interesting. I want to say a story of, I heard of um, two great sages, uh, two great chassidim, Remendel Futafais, um, that was arrested many years in Russia. Then he went out and um, um, no, Rabbi Reichek from Los Angeles, he was from Europe and from Poland and he came, he was in LA for many years. Very great chassidim. And one time they were both together in a taxi. I'm not sure exactly where they were traveling to. So Rabbi Futa said to Rabbi Reichek, he says, no, say a mimer, say some Hasidic discourse. He said, you know what? I, I'm not up to it now, I can't. Uh, it wasn't just something like you can just say, you know, he was, so he told me, you know what? So let's say the 12 passages, the 12 psukim. And you think, the Rebbe said the 12 psukim, 12 passages, you can think of something so simple. Every little child knows it by heart, but it contains, as I said, like 12 steps of learning. So let's do, we're going to concentrate the, the last six. And we'll do the number seven. The number seven pasuk speaks about Bereshit bara elokim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. It's from the Torah. In the beginning, Hashem created heaven and earth. As, as we said, those of you who came a little late, there were 12 passages that the Rebbe chose from different parts of the Torah, and he told us to study it by heart, to memorize, and that should help us. We we'll see how we can learn from each one. Well, we all know Hashem created the world. What's the big deal in it? What did the Rebbe want us to learn from it? The Rebbe wanted us to learn from it is that yes, Hashem created the world. Hashem created the world for us to purify it, to perfect it, to work on it, to make it a dwelling place to Hashem, to know that Hashem is the owner of the world. And everything that happens has a reason. But if we saw it, we have to make it better. Not to sit quietly and, 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 and be quiet and say, okay, so it happened to this, it's happened to this. No, we have to help. If God forbid we know that somebody is not well, whether we know them or we don't know them, we have to help. We have to do whatever we can. We have to protect. We have to be strong about things that are that we know are important because it's in our hands. Hashem created the world for us to make it a better place. Imagine if we read that passage and when we read it, we don't only think, yeah, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Sure, we know God created heaven and earth. But when we think that this is up to us, 
that we have to do something about it, this is amazing. Another thing that I want to tell you is the fact that the Rebbe said to memorize it. What's a big deal to memorize? When you memorize, it becomes part of you. You keep on, say, you kept on saying it over and over and over and over. It becomes something that you believe in, that you know. By the way, I want to tell you that we have a custom that we like to learn. Another 11 minutes. Uh, usually boys do it. Mostly boys do it. I know I tried to do it also. I don't know if I did it very good before my bat mitzvah. It was a big job. We learn the 12 first 12 chapters of Tanya by heart. It's not easy, girls. It's a big job. Some chapters are very long. It's basically Kabbalah, Hasidus, you know, Tanya. You don't really understand what you're learning, especially when you're a 10, 11, or 12-year-old or 13-year-old kid. Boys learn it, you know, till the 13 girls. We do it till 12. Um, many people don't do it. It's a custom that I we really... Uh, empowered our kids to do it, especially push the boys more, if I may, because the boys learn it in school and it's something that is in yeshiva. Shlemel is not learning it in school, neither did Yossi or Levi or Yudi or Avrami. They had to do it at home. And Shlemel is learning. He is Baruch Hashem 11, soon he's going to be 12, you know, in a few months. And I want him to finish it. And the Chayas also learned some, not all of it, but you know, my girls learned some, but with them we try. So I decided, he said, you know, lately he said, mommy, it's hard. Like it's hard to learn by heart, especially when you don't necessarily understand it. I mean, which obviously you understand, but still it's our Aramaic words and, and everything so on and so forth. So we said, let's learn it together. We started it this week. We accomplished so much more because we're learning together. And I told him, thank you for that. I asked him, I said, do you think we'll learn together? So we sit together, we go, you know, one, two, three, I'm telling you what I did. I remember when I was a child and I learned. And it's amazing because what I learned when I was a young kid, I still remember. What I learned now, I don't remember the following day. I'm sure all of you can testify for that. But when we learn as children, we remember. But it's great. We sit together and we say it together over and over and over. Obviously, he remembers better than me, but we accomplish. And it's amazing that something is in your head, something that you learn. But the Rebbe meant by us learning it, that we have to become saturated, filled in with words of Torah. When we're filled in, when it becomes part of us, then we can live a better life. We can live a more holy life. When we say the Pasuk, Bereshit Barai Lokim, Hashem created the world, the heaven and the earth, when we wake up in the morning, we speak about it, spoke about it many times, Baruch Hashem, every morning we should wake up, amen. And Moshiach will come and then we'll live forever. Amen. And we say, Thank you, Hashem, for giving me another day that I woke up. And Rabbi Monatecha, you trust in me, is great. And your mind is full. You think about what do I want to accomplish today? Do I want to make more money? For sure. I want to go to work. I want to make money, whatever my job is. But why do I want to make money? Because I want to give some more tzedakah. Because I want to be able to buy kosher food, even if I don't do it for every day of the week, yet I want to do it for Shabbos. Maybe I'm going to buy something kosher for my friend. So she has something kosher. You know, your mind is a different thinking mind. Um, like that child, you know, that he was optimistic. He saw lightning and he said, oh, God is taking a picture of me and not, so, you know, not being scared. I heard from a lady that had to take MRI test. Thank goodness everything is okay, but sometimes it happens we have to take an MRI. And you lay there, right? Like a, a tunnel and it's scary and you, you know, and you thinking. Now, if you know, there was a Lubavitch lady, a from lady, when she was laying there, she said, what was she doing? If she wouldn't have her mind memorizing so many holy things in her mind, a chapter of Tehillim, something in Torah, something in Tanya, uh, the, the 12 passages, whatever it is. If your mind is full, she was laying there and she was praying. She was saying words of Torah, right? You can pray in English, in whatever you know. If she wouldn't be full with that, if that wasn't part of her life, it's so, so important, she would be worried. She would be laying there, oh God, 
this test. God knows what will be the results, what will be. And then it escalates and you become negative and you become anxious and you become worried and, and so on and so forth. But when your mind is full of Torah, so the idealism that you have, idealistic, you can be realistic. Because when we study, when we think, when those things are important, it becomes part of our life. Because we make it part of our life. You know, girls, in the early years, uh, after World War II, before that as well, when the Jewish people started, when they even started immigrating to the United States of America, many years ago, beginning, even the beginning of the 1900s and later, um, it was hard. In the little shtetl, it was very hard as well. But somehow, in the old home, in the Alta Haim, as we say in Yiddish, we all know our grandparents, grand-grandparents, everybody was religious. Everybody learned Torah. Everybody kept everything. Life was very hard, but that was life. We knew that's what it is. And we were proud of doing it. And the jobs we did, whatever we did, we tried to keep Shabbos. That, that, was, that was life. There isn't life without keeping Shabbos. But it was a very big test. Very, very big test. And those hidden, when they came to America, they realized that if they didn't work on Shabbos, and in those years, there wasn't such a thing, if you say you're religious, you would lose your job in the beginning of the 1900s, even in the middle, you know, 1950 and 60. If you didn't work on Shabbos, you had to work six days a week. There wasn't such a thing. And it was a very big test. I know of many stories, many families, that it was very sad. They said, you know, the grandparents were from, kept everything. And then once they came to the new countries, little by little, and many people couldn't stand the test. And they said, we have to work. And if we're not going to work, Hashem is going to lose our job. And Hashem should not test anyone. We cannot, I cannot say anything wrong. I mean, it's hard. I know what my parents went through in Russia. And I shared with you some stories. How my father tried to keep Shabbos and Baruch Hashem he kept. And it wasn't easy. And he knew that if he will be caught, that he's keeping Shabbos, he's going to be put in jail. But he knew that life without Shabbos is not a life for yet because he was saturated since he was a child with the Torah, with the belief, with the mitzvahs. And we knew that's what life is. This is what a yid is. And we were strong with it. And that it was easier to go through if we don't have that uh, vaccine against the immunization against all the winds, it's a little bit harder. As we know here in Calgary, it's a little bit harder. It's much harder, all of you can testify, it's much harder here in Calgary to keep kosher than in Toronto, than in Montreal, than in New York, than in Israel, because you have it, you have it more. You know, it, I must say it hurt my heart. I was today, I asked her, she's flying now from Toronto. So she told Shleimala, some sweets. I gave her money. I said, put money in the car. I said, buy some stuff, some sweets. We don't believe in a lot of sugar, but something you're coming. So she told him a name, I don't know, name of some kind of a treat, some kind of candy. And he told her what? It's kosher. I always see kids in a kiva eat it, but it's not, you know, it's not kosher for us. She said, yeah, they make it now kosher. And I always used to see all the kids eat it. And I really wanted to eat it. I can never eat it. So now I saw that it's kosher. I decided to buy it for you as well. And when I listened to it, I thought, wow, it's not easy. They're young kids. And they see those things every day. The kids bring stuff for school. And many things are kosher, but it's not halal Israel. Like we keep a higher standard. So many of those kids, I mean, she did say, I think it was kosher, but it wasn't halal Israel. And now they do do it. I guess in New York, they, in Toronto, you can buy it. And they knew, they would never ask. As I shared with you, you know, I can go to the store with them. They can be very little, very young, a three-year-old. He'll nag. If I tell him or her, I say, it's not kosher. They don't say nothing again. They will nag for the stuff that is kosher I should buy because they know that they can change my mind. But they know from birth, it, it's so strong. They know if it's not kosher, it just, there's no ways about it. So those two, they were two friends. They were tested with jobs in New York. And they were very strong. They said, you know, we are not going to break the Shabbos. We can't. 
many of the friends did, and God forbid, I'm not judging. And I hope everybody understands you, God forbid, not judging, we just tell you stories of heroes because we learn from them, because it's not easy. And we all know how not easy it is to keep Shabbos. It's very special, very important, but it's not easy. So those two, two friends, two adult men, they had families, they said they are going to keep on keeping Shabbos. And almost every week, every other week, Friday came and they said they can't come tomorrow and they will lose their job. And then it's very sad. Nobody should be, no should be tested like that. And then when the kids grew up and these men were a little bit older, they were still keeping Shabbos and somehow they survived. One man, one fellow, his family, his children, grandkids, they all stayed observant, happy, religious Jews. The other one, they didn't. And he was very torn about it. He was very sad. And he came to a rabbi, and I was told he came to a Moshe Feinstein in New York, and he said, how come? I also didn't work on Shabbos, just like my friend. But he was lucky enough that his family continued in his life, in his path, in the path of Torah, what he taught. And, and mine didn't. What did I do wrong? Where did I go wrong? So the rabbi told him, you know, when you would come home on Friday and you knew that unfortunately you have no job to go back on Monday because you were fired that Friday, you had the meal with your family. Your children sat at the table, you had a meal, but you were sad. You were complaining. You were saying how hard life is in America. And it's so hard when you keep Shabbos and I don't know what will be. And, uh, you said you're not going to break Shabbos. You were very strong, but it was said. You, you, were, you were anxious. You were, And the children heard it over and over and over again. So what did they learn from you? They learned from you without you telling them that it's very special to keep Shabbos, but it's very hard. It's so hard. So once they left home and they started building their own lives, they decided not to continue because they don't want to have hard life. The way you showed them Shabbos wasn't happy. Your friend, on the other hand, when he would come home on Friday, and unfortunately he knew that he has no job to go to on Monday, and he also had a large family to feed, he didn't complain. He would tell his children that he's so happy that he was able to withstand the test and not to go to work tomorrow. He was, he was so happy that he was able to keep the joy of Shabbos. He was so happy that he is a Yid and he is a, he is a Jew and he has Torah and mitzvahs and he knows that Hashem will not let them go hungry and he is going to find another job. He was very optimistic. He had like the life of a child. He was looking towards something better. So the children in that house grew up. They realized that it wasn't easy, but they grew up with a lot of happiness. It was fun to be, to be a yid. It was fun to keep Shabbos. It was fun to do things. There was simcha. There was joy. It was good. Yeah, there's always hardships. It's not fun to brush teeth when you're a three-year-old or even a 10-year-old and floss then for two minutes and mom say, do it, do it, do it. But you know, because you explain that your teeth, you're going to have fresh breath. You're not going to have cavities. You say it in a good way and the children are happy. And this we're learning from the second pasuk, from the second verse that the Rebbe told us told you were 12, right? And we'll have to finish with that. Veshinantam levanecha, that it's a pasuk that we say in Shema. Veshinantam levanecha vedibarta bam, that you should teach it to your children and you should speak about the Torah everywhere you go, when you are home, when you get up in the morning, when you go to sleep. This is such an amazing story because here both of them did the same thing. Both men kept Shabbos and they really sacrificed a lot. The men that lost a job every week or every month or every two weeks or whatever it was, it's terrible. It's so hard. It's so sad. But he had sadness with it. He did not show his children the happiness. And that's what we are learning, that we should show the happiness. We should do whatever girls we're doing. I know a lot of us have already adult children. A lot of us still have young kids. Some of us got willing, 
going to have children still not married or, or young married. We have grandchildren. Whatever we do, girls, it's important to show, to do it with happiness, but we have to study. We have to know. It's very hard to give an attitude of happiness of something good if you don't mean if, if, if you don't feel it, we have to be saturated with it, then the children will feel it. And that's why I brought that example with Schleimler that I'm learning with him. I like to learn, Tani. We're doing it together. So I'm enthusiastic. He is enthusiastic. It's not something I'm telling him, you have to do it. Yeah, I want him to do it because it's something so special. He'll be so happy. My husband, you know, my boys, did, my husband did it. And then after they, they learn it again, some of my girls, however, they learned. Then they're so happy. They say, Baruch Hashem, that you encourage me. And it tells me, I'm, I'm, I love to learn just hard. So I said, okay, let's do it together. We have to find ways. Children know what you mean, what you don't. When you go on a vacation, what do you pack with you? I rem you remember we shared with you the story of the gentleman who was going on a, oh, it's getting late. Still, the sun is out. Uh, he was going on a cruise for Pesach. So he called his rabbi and he asked the rabbi, what should I do? I'm going on the cruise on pay for Pesach. What should I do? He says, well, next year you should look better on the calendar. What can you do? You can't do nothing. He says, rabbi, that's not what I called you for. I called you so you should help me what I should do. How can I do a seder over there? I didn't call you to tell me it's too bad. Everywhere we go, we go on vacation. What do we take? We take clothes, we take this. When we pack, we know first thing, we take a cedar, we take negelvas, we take the, the thing to wash our hands for amotzi, we take uh, learning books, we take every child that takes on their level. This is part, you take clothes, you take a swimming set, uh, swimsuit, and you take lab, you take a chumash, because this is part of our life. It's not something that we're doing somebody a favor. When you grow up in such an atmosphere, it's much easier but it's never too late. That's what the Rebbe taught us. We're all children of Hashem. And this is the nice thing that the Rebbe taught us. And as we are coming to the third of Tammuz, let's dwell on that part in our personality. Let's think that we are as children, curious, want to learn, want to do more, want to explore. We don't want to be set in our ways. Some ways it's good to be set if it's good ways, but not to be stuck up. Not to be judgmental, it's all good. So this happened, let's laugh about it. There is something good. Tomorrow will be something better. And just to see the, I see God is so, so much here, but you know what we were able to learn, but perhaps we'll do more the other. We spoke today a little bit about two of them. Maybe we'll discuss some other times, other 10. And to be honest, I never studied it in depth the way I did now. When I was preparing the class and I opened up my eyes myself because I used to wonder many times. I knew, I knew as much as we know how the Rebbe cherished every moment. He never took a day of vacation, never traveled anywhere, never went to see Chabaras. There have been so many Chabaras around the world. We put so much work with us, the Rebbe, come see what we're doing, enjoy, like see our fruits of our labor. The Rebbe said, doesn't have time to travel. And here the Rebbe would stand for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and hear little kids say, Shema, Shema, Israel, Israel, Hashem. And he would say too, because there was so much depth in those psukim, in those verses. And as we said, the one about education, I know that all of you here, you are very educated women. You want to learn. That's why you're coming to our get-togethers. You want to learn. You want to know. And let's learn more. Let us get, as I said, again, the word saturated with it. It should be part of us. And then becomes part of us. It will grow to our kids, even to our married kids, even to our adult kids, to our grandchildren, because all of a sudden they see what your interests are. They see you going on vacation and grandma is taking a library book that has a Shabbos story, that is a story of tzedakah, because those things are important. It's part of our life. It's something that we do. It's not we tell our kids. And then they see, so they want to do it too, and it helps us. When I drive, and I think I mentioned that to you, I know, well, I, I say a lot of Tehillim, a lot of Psalms of David. After a while, if you say the same chapter every day, every day, every day, it's a good thing to do. It's good to do other ones. You can pick a short one, you happen to know it by heart. So when you drive, your mind can be full of worrying, what you're doing, what this, you know it, I just say it. I just say the words because otherwise it's wasting time. Because I put in my head, I know that every moment 
that we are here, we have to use for something good. We have to do something good. So when I'm driving, it's not good to carry a conversation and to counsel somebody because I have to concentrate on my driving. When I pray, I have to concentrate. Good. But when I drive, so I say things by heart. It's not a prayer. Tehilim, a class we learn. I listen to something because it comes from the from the thinking that Hashem created the world. Right, I know. Why do I say it every day? Why did the Rebbe say to say it every day? Because when I say Hashem created the world, that means he wants me and you and you, all of us, to make the world a better place. So make the world a better place. My mind is to be occupied with holy things, with spiritual stuff, with godly stuff. Obviously, mundane stuff too. We are human. We live in, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in a physical world. But your mind is so, when your mind is in holy stuff, you are less jealous. You're less, you know, less competition, less angry, less. All those things are not as important because you look at life in a different way. So, okay, so she told me something. I will forgive her because I want somebody to forgive me. I don't want to go to sleep and my soul goes to heaven and go to sleep and I hurt somebody's feelings. I don't want to do that. I don't want it to happen to me. So I'm going to give, forgive my friend, even though she didn't ask me for forgiveness or he didn't ask for forgiveness because I don't want their soul to go to, to heaven when they sleep and God will say, oh, why did you hurt Rachel? So I forgive her. It's not easy. I'm just saying, you know, when we look at life a little bit in a different way, and this is also something with kids. Kids don't hold grudges. They fight. I hate you. I'm not going to give you my toy in the following day. They're best friends. Kids know very well how to do it. We don't. We should learn to do that. We should never say, I'm not going to be your friend and, and say bad things. But if we do have, you know, we should learn to do that. Thank you so much for all the stuff that you wrote. Um, mazel tov again to Risha. I'm sorry, Risha, I didn't realize. I was so passionate. I wrote so many things about those psukim. But I think we got the gist of the joy, of the enthusiasm. And Rosh Chodesh today, tomorrow, we're going to light candles. And perhaps, Risha, you'll share with us some other time because today is already, and by you, it's already uh, after after 11. God willing, we'll make time, another time, maybe next week, Hashanah will be there to share a story. And that will be a nice thing. Maybe we should put it sometimes in our classes from time to time, somebody share some story about our ancestors. I think it's very nice because we love to learn from all our ancestors. Thank you. Have a good Shabbos, a good Chaydesh. Thank you, everybody. Mazel tov. Mazel tov, the new baby. Mazel tov, mazel tov. Thank and you, thank, thank you. All. you. So good to see you, Mrs. Wadra. I've not seen you for a while. Marina, Janina, Chagit still here. Yajina, Risha, Sanel, Adina, and Jennifer. So much what to say, right? Sometimes I feel like we can be hours sitting here. And we will not finish everything. And Mrs. Wedge, I hope you got the little thing I sent you. You'll tell me later. I can't hear. Okay. okay. Sorry. Thank you so much. My I'm you, I didn't know, but I deserve. Did you know Lenny Shapiro is already home? You know. Oh yeah, for sure. We were in yeah, touch he's home. He was all so the safe. time. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 We yeah. came home a few days ago. Baruch Hashem. Oh, we yeah, were davening yeah. so much. Yeah. 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 Baruch Hashem, but thank you for sharing for sure. Yeah. We should always yeah. be home, healthy, happy, and all the best. Thank Take care, so and much. I should go. My pleasure. I'll go prepare. The room for High Esther and stuff. I'm so excited she's coming. I went shopping to the girls, believe it or not, a quarter to seven in the morning, 6.45. Because I know during the day, I don't have time to leave Chabad. And I said, I want to buy juice. I want to buy some fruits that she likes. So Baruch Hashem did it. I could have complained and I said, thank God I have the energy. I'm tired now, but... That's not know. your job to complain. I complain. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't complain either. You're allowed. Complaining would have been. Okay, a, sometimes I'll, you complain a little I'll, bit. I have to say, a trade, I would be a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I so have. Um, I yeah. had. What did I have? If I would lose, no. If, if I would get, I think if I would lose a pound for every word or something like that, it says I would be a superman. <laughs> I think all of us would be if we lost pounds. And nobody can lose it. I'm finding it. So nobody lost. Sorry? I find it. 
I you find them? Yeah. All of us find that I think after 40 and after 50 and after I don't know yet after 60, but we try and God willing, we all know it. Yeah. Take care. Good job. As Maslow so again, Risha, how wonderful. Thank and you. a good job as Mrs. Uh, Wedro will be in touch. Jennifer and Adina. Thank you. My best to the rabbi. Oh, sure. I will. God Thanks. willing. And, and Rishi, you know, your whole family. Nieces, they all um, got in to sponsor the class. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.